We're in a bit of a creative space here. Um, next to Phil, we have Jess Webb, who has a, a background in finance and agribusiness with an MBA and extensive experience in corporate communications and public relations, as well as freelance journalism. So welcome, Jess. Next to Jess is I'm going to have to use a cliche, even though I've told people never to use it, but a man who needs no introduction, Ollie Flower. He's our very own Renaissance man, uh, intensivist, artist, graphic designer, and brainchild between, uh, behind all of this. Then we have Carol Hodgson, who is an ICU physiotherapist and professor and deputy director of the Australian and New Zealand Intensive Care Research Centre, leading multi-centre international trials in ICU rehabilitation, ECMO and mechanical ventilation, to name a couple. Des Gorman sits next to her, and he's come at creativity, I'd like to say like from under the sea. He is ex-Navy, uh, a submariner, I believe, and is now, or has been a physician for a good number of years, and is now Dean of Medical School. Uh, and next to him is also a man who needs very little introduction. He is your Twitter moderator, and tweet at him madly, please. Mr. M. Crit himself, at M. Crit, but I don't really need to tell you that. So I'm going to ask each of the panel members the same question, and I'd like them to give me a bit of a... I'm going to cut you down to a two-minute spiel. So the first question I'm going to put to all of you is, what is creativity? And why is it so important for clinicians? Phil, you get to go first. Wow. Uh, so creativity, part of it is problem solving. Um, a definition that's often repeated is something novel and useful, as if you need to fulfill both criteria. And I think that's valuable. You've mentioned the big C creativity. There's little C. So the big C is about the, the big stuff, the, the light bulb invention, for example. The little C is you figuring out a shortcut tomorrow. So there's that. And I think that it's useful to remind ourselves that creativity is lots of different things. It can result in functional, usable, novel things. But I think often we lose sight of the fact that the process involves lots of different things as well. It's reframing problems. It's thinking differently. It's using your imagination. Even things like thinking on your feet, improvising. Making someone laugh is really a form of creativity that I think too often people lose sight of the degree to which creativity is part of the human condition. Yes, it's a skill that you can develop, but we all have it. We all have had for years. So I think creativity for me, yes, is a number of different things. It can be seen as the functional thing, but it's also something that we own in so many different ways. Thank you. Jess. To touch on Phil's point, I think creativity is about a number of things, but importantly, creativity is about keeping, maintaining a fresh, fresh approach to what you bring to your work life, your team, your, um, your division, your department. And to do that, you have to get out of your comfort zone. You have to break the circuit, um, go to events like this, cross-pollinate and, and bring fresh ideas back into your environment in order to spark um, you know, some innovation and, and, and progress. Um, otherwise, we're just on that tra same treadmill continuing on and on. Um, and that's you know, where blind spots take place and you know, productivity can dive. Um, so it's about maintaining a fresh approach. Thank you. Ollie. Uh, yes, I guess in a more concrete way, I think of creativity in terms of making graphics or styling or more obvious um, outlets for creativity and the benefits of that. Um, and as Kirill alluded to this morning, it can be a fantastic outlet for clinicians uh, as a form of escape and flow and all the positive things that doing uh, a creative process can do for clinicians. Um, but I also think that outside of those more traditional thoughts of what creativity are, I think you use creativity in every activity you do in life, whether it's parenting or packing the car and trying to fit everything in it or um, how you play Lego or um, but then if you take it back to work, um, it's how you conduct a ward round or how you um, 
work out how to interact with a difficult colleague, or all of those things require creativity. So I think it's just an integral part of how we function. Thank you. Carol? Well, I've been wondering what I'm doing on this panel because I think I'm the least creative person I know. Uh, I don't have a creative bone in my body. I couldn't draw as a child. Um, physio was great for me because we just do stick figures, so that's sort of perfect. Uh, and then as I got thinking about the topic of creativity. I reflected on uh, clinical trials, which is sort of core business for the job that I do now. And I guess creativity is uh, asking us to think differently about how we do things now. So is there a better way that we can treat our patients? Is there a better way we can manage the workload? Is there a better way that we can um, coordinate our staff so that it's more appropriate? And I, and I do think creativity comes into our work life incredibly in that way. And the trials that we do are all very creative and I love the way that we brainstorm them and come up with a really uh, interesting and specific question. Thank you. Des. Oh, thanks, Michelle. I, for me, um, the cornerstone of creativity is uh, originality. And I have to say in the 40-something years I've been practicing medicine, I haven't seen much of that. Um, I've seen innovative behaviour, and it's sometimes disruptive, usually not. Generally, it's just variations on a theme. Uh, in, in my view, in fact, we take these wonderful, bright young people into medicine, we worship the altar of knowledge, and we crush scepticism and originality out of them. And so, in fact, I, I must say that I think the whole concept of creativity is wonderful, and I hope I trip over it someday soon. In a, in a health setting. <laughs> Thank you. And now, just for a rapid fire question, I want to get the opinion. Uh, you're only allowed a sort of single uh, word answer to this one of each of you on the panel. And we're going to start from you, Des. The second question is what is more important for creativity? Deep knowledge of one subject, broad knowledge across many, the traditional polymath or Renaissance man or woman? or the hive mind of many individuals with a range of expertise? Yes, well, well being a 65-year-old male, I lost that train of question somewhere back at the very beginning. It was far... <laughs> uh, that, that required complex multitasking, and it left me. Uh, uh, I think if I had to answer the, uh, answer the question glibly, it would be that real originality will come in healthcare when we actually reorient ourselves uh, my perspective is that we're a service industry that is predominantly focused on the needs of the people who provide the services. And I actually genuinely believe that until we fundamentally change that view and understand who we serve and what their expectations and requirements are, originality will continue to maintain the, the if you like, the property, intellectual and otherwise, of the craft guilds. So I, I'm sorry I didn't answer your question, but. You lost me at the beginning. Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd like to have a buzzer or something, or maybe we can hold up cards or something. I don't know, t 10 answers. Uh, yes, Carol. Well, I think I want option D, all of the above. <laughs> I'm, I'm not happy with A, B or C in isolation. I think uh, creativity needs experts, but it also needs diverse input, and, and I don't think you need to have one or the other. I think you can bring it all to the table. Nice. Ollie? I'm going to go with hive mind, but it depends which bees are in the hive. <laughs> <laughs> and you also need like a queen bee or someone in charge to make sure that, um, that the uh, organization can be agile and, and responsive and uh, recognize which are the good ideas and which are the rubbish ones. Mm -hmm. Jess. <laughs> I'm going to go with Carol's point. I think it's a blend, but it also depends on the context. I think sometimes when you are solving a problem, it's good to have a posse that, of experts or people with that technical expertise to be able to add value quickly and see you know, the perspective that you're bringing. Um, and they'll get where you're coming from quickly and you can start to spitball and, and get to a range of solutions, perhaps. Um, but then in other cases, it's important to sometimes throw that to a whole outside perspective and or group of people that might come at it from a completely different perspective. Um, so I think it's about the context um, and, and knowing when to leverage or push and pull each. Thank yeah. you. And Phil, aka God. 
What do you think? Wow. That's a, <laughs> quite a harsh lead in. Um, so from a personal perspective, I think that creativity is less about single-minded specialization and more about cultivating interest in lots of things. It's said that Nobel Prize winning scientists are twice as likely than average to be also musicians or writers, playwrights, novelists, and let's face it, they're pretty busy. Um, so where does that leave the team or the hive mind? I think that, I agree with Ollie's point actually, while the hive mind is a nice concept and creativity can be a emergent property, I suppose, what a hive mind lacks is the leadership or the clarity or the vision or the sense of purpose that when you come to action creativity, when you come to implement and iterate, that's where the hive mind might fall short. So again, borrowing from the, the rest of the panel, I don't think it's A, B or C. I answer it that creativity is more about collaborative variants that can happen as individuals or teams with a clear purpose. I see. So it seems as though collecting good teams around you is very key to yeah. starting that creative process. So and I want to, variable teams. And variable, yeah. absolutely. I would like to ask Carol, who's obviously had an enormous amount of experience with uh, getting teams together to do uh, broad-reaching projects. Um, how do you go about assembling uh, the most creative team you can? Uh, so I, I'm going to borrow from our clinical trials group. Um, so the Australian New Zealand Intensive Care Clinical Trials Group has a meeting in Noosa every year. There's a few key ingredients that I think are really important. Um, the first one is everybody is very positive and excited to be there. So you bring everybody into somewhere where they really are going to have a good time. It's a very safe place. I think that people can put their hand up and speak or stand up and present an idea and they know that they will get good feedback but it will be given in a very, um, uh, you know, non-confronting manner. Uh, we all go out and eat and drink and have a great time together. So there's a lot of downtime where our brains are clearly starting to bounce off each other and it's not just about work. And I think on top of that, you've got some of the best in the business who will guide some seed ideas. So as people come up with these brilliant ideas, there's some really uh, good experts who will set you along the right path. So um, perhaps that's a really nice recipe for success. So we're all talking about this connectedness, uh, and I guess another word for that might be networking or having a network of people. Uh, I'm, I'm interested to hear from you, Jess. In this uh, age that we're in at the moment, uh, is there any reason why we can't digitally have uh, great networking? Do we need to be face-to-face? For example, you know, we need to be environmentally responsible. Should we be flying places like this to get together face to face? What's the advantage of a face to face meeting over, say, Skype? Yeah, I mean, there's plenty to be said for the digital age and digital technology and platforms enabling people to connect and access information and, and other people at networks and so forth. But, you know, I'm going to go back to basics and, and hold the old school point here that we need to spend time face to face. Video conferencing and sp Skype, and, and there's a lot to be said for that, but if you really want innovation uh, and creativity to occur, you need to get people together and you need to do that in person. The next steps can be followed through using digital technology, Skype, Zoom, whatever you call it. But that face-to-face, -face, that power is, 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 is very important. And companies need to give people the time and space um, and delegated authority to, to engage in person um, and build networks and to facilitate that. Uh, we were talking earlier about a theory called media richness theory. Yeah, so is the this relate to any of this? Yeah, I mean, the media richness theory, I think, speaks to um, the, the richer the media, the more effective the communication. So when you look at it in context of, say, face-to-face -face in the digital age, I guess, when uh, you, you, the power of a phone call versus the in-person engagement um, that you might face where you're picking up 
uh, non-verbal cues, body language and so forth. And when you think of the world these days, I think it's 85% of communication is non-verbal. Just being there face to face, um, you know, you pick up on a lot more, uh, you can have a lot more impact. I'm going to throw down to the very other end, lob, a, lob the ball to you, Scott. Has anything come through on Twitter yet? Or yeah, is there, it not working? There, there's quite a bit. And I, I guess the first thing that has come up is the vast majority is affirming all the messages being said here. But there is a small but vocal minority saying, do we really need to be talking about creativity? Is this not just fluff? Is this just TED Talk? Perhaps we should be inspiring less creativity in doctors. There's already enough doctors going in all sorts of divergent directions. Maybe we should just buckle down and follow evidence and stop trying to be so creative. Maybe we get some response to that. <laughs> Absolutely. I think to reframe that, it sounds like I'm too busy to be creative. Culturally, we can't be creative because there's too much to do. Let's buckle down, let's apply. And it's back to the challenge I was kind of trying to demonstrate earlier, not just from a brain's perspective, that creativity, problem solving, insight, new ways of working happens when we stop doing that sort of stuff. But maybe there's no point accelerating and applying if you're going the wrong way. So I'm all up for being productive and getting on with stuff and you know, executing. And it's actually the final stage of the creative process. You need to apply this stuff. It can't just be ideas and concepts and discussions. But if we don't prioritize and acknowledge the value in maybe shift the word creativity and it becomes more about what we've sp spoken about, innovating, thinking originally, improving systems, improving our own skills. If we don't do that, then we're just not developing. We're not evolving as individuals, as organizations, as cultures. So yeah, I'm a firm believer that we need to actually increase the amount of time, resources that we give to facilitating creativity in other people. So that's my response to that. And my interpretation of that is perhaps you'd like a little bit more on the practical side. I think uh, maybe I could ask the panel a couple of more uh, sort of pragmatic questions. Ollie, we talked a bit about slow motion multitasking as a tool to be more creative. Could you expand on that? Yeah, so slow motion multitasking was something I'd come across that actually made me feel much better about myself. <laughs> so it's not the sort of multitasking we're talking about like texting and driving or um, <laughs> that, that sort of thing. It's um, this concept that uh, if you do multiple different activities um, over a long period, they all complement each other and resonate with each other and improve your productivity, originality, and creativity within those individual spheres. So um, when you hear about some uh, more famous examples of that, such as like when Michael Crichton, was, he was a doctor, but he was also an author, and he was also writing, um, you know, he's making films about dinosaurs as well as writing ER and um, doing multiple things at the same time. He also wrote books about computer programming and they all complemented each other and made him overall very successful. Or um, Einstein was working on Brownian motion, theory of relativity, um, E equals MC squared, and the laser all at the same time as well, a bit different, all worked. So uh, it did make me feel better that I've got lots of rods in the fire myself and <laughs> that yes. it wasn't all bad. Yes, I mean, interesting. It's an interesting thought that perhaps people could think that that this is um, fluff, and it may be the terminology. Maybe we need to stop using that term, creativity. Um, talking about bad raps, I read very recently a, an article about some of the um, corporations in Silicon Valley and how creativity is being corporatized. Um, you know, it's uh, in the, you succumb to bureaucracy and number crunching where places and uh, corporations have creativity indices and they've got to reach benchmarks, etc. So maybe it's an overused term. Maybe we're using the wrong term. I'd be interested, um, Des, to ask you about, you've, you said you're a disruptor, which seems an awful thing to be if you're a submariner. 
I wouldn't imagine being disruptive is very well tolerated in the submarine, but there you go. Maybe this, the disruption came afterwards. How, have you, how do you marry up disruption with creative thinking and that process? Yeah, um, thanks for the question. I, I'm still thinking about the issue Scott raised, because I'm actually very sympathetic to that point of view, actually. Yeah. Uh, I think we, in a lot of healthcare, use a Rolls Royce to deliver the milk. Uh, and the whole mega trend in healthcare at the moment is through research to shift. If you think about life in terms of predictability and complexity is on different axes, is to take as many health problems as possible from the unpredictable complex quadrant and put it in the predictable simple quadrant, because then you can put a rule on it and you can commoditize it and you can automate it. And that's what medical science is doing. It's driving from the unpredictable complex quadrant to the uh, predictable simple quadrant. And maybe where originality sits is where things remain biopsychosocially complex. And that's where uh, being disruptive matters because in fact, if you think about things like mental health and you think about things like metabolic diseases and you think about uh, things like degenerative diseases, uh, they don't lend themselves to the current models of care. They, they are simply failing. And the reason for that is because they're transactional. And so there needs to be very original and disruptive thinking uh, in those spaces where healthcare cannot be commoditized. And I don't think we should be frightened of describing healthcare as commodities. If it can be commoditizable, let's do it. And let's put people like you, who presumably are intelligent, or at least you were, before you went through medical school and nursing school, let's, let's get you to play where you can add value. And I think that's the, to me, uh, disruptive behavior is something that you drive understanding what people need and expect. You define what success looks like. And then you need the courage to be absolutely agnostic about how you deliver it. If you have a clear view of what the outcomes are that you want, you need then to have the courage to be agnostic about the way in which that is delivered. So it's, it's, a very, it's a slightly more complicated answer to your question than I think you expected. Being disruptive on a submarine means that you refuse to share a bunk with some smelly individual who's just come off watch, and you sleep in the after ends on the torpedoes. That's being disruptive. So I'd like to perhaps stay with you, Desmond, and, and maybe look at a few more solutions. I mean, I think we all agree perhaps we're not quite as jaded as you are about the whole um, health bureaucracy. Uh, uh, but maybe we all will be soon. <laughs> Answers, solutions, practical ways to, to turn the Titanic around, to keep with our Norfolkal theme. Any, Des, I'm going to throw it right back to you. How, how can you... Uh, uh, solutions, any, any practical ways that we can really ch change that entrenched behaviour both at an individual and a, and a um, yeah. sort of societal level. The, um, I'll give you an example, Michelle. There are six projects we're currently running in New Zealand, mainly around mental health, ones in people who've had strokes, where we have used big data analyses to identify vulnerable people and what their total lifetime cost is across the whole of society so that we have a very comprehensive idea of their counterfactual so we can size and investment to beat it. But in fact, it's that next step where you step back from offering the solution and actually work with the community you're serving and allow very unusual forms of healthcare to break out. Uh, and of the six projects we're running, the model of care and the six are completely dissimilar. They're local solutions for local need. And I think increasingly in very sophisticated health systems, we're seeing the role of intelligence agencies is to inform groups of users and providers so that they can get local solutions for local need. And I come back to the point I was making here before, you need the courage to be agnostic. You need to have a clear view of what success looks like. You need to be absolutely outcome predicated. For example, in our mental health patient groups, when we said to them, what is it that you want? It wasn't less antidepressant medication. It wasn't a better depression score. It was, I want to live independently and I want a job. So we focused the whole of their care around two things, getting them to live independently and to get a job. 
which means that the workforce that's developed does not look like a conventional psychological workforce in any shape or form. So I, I actually think that's where innovation sits. Innovation sits where you have both financial risk and outcome risk, and you create the tension between those two. Outcome risk by itself and financial risk by itself doesn't create the tension you need. You need both interplaying to generate genuinely innovative solutions. Mm -hmm. um, I'd like to take a quick break from my scripted questions, which is always dangerous, and maybe get a couple of you to be able to persuade the audience why, why creativity is so fundamentally important. We've heard Des's um, ideas, and I'd like to, to why, is, why is a discussion about creativity so very important right now? Jess, do you have any thoughts on that? I mean, part of it's risk management. I mean, look at the Uber and what it's done to the taxi industry. I mean, we all know the risk of not uh, keeping an open mind to innovative practices and the way things can then take down a whole, a whole industry. Um, but, you know, to your point before about corporatizing innovation, I mean... <laughs> before the whole innovative buzzwords, they come and go. Sustainability is another one that, you know, we probably were seeing done to death maybe 10 years ago in the business community. Now it's tech and it's innovation and it's all of those buzzwords. But the issues remain the same. We still need to address, we still need to do the right thing by the planet. We still need to be sustainable in how we behave. We still need to be fresh in how we approach a problem. So that's, you know, that's speaking to the innovation and the creativity piece. Um, it's about managing that risk um, and being one step ahead. Anyone else have anything to add there, um, Phil? Yeah, I think it's back to acknowledging, yeah, the world is changing. And if, that, if there is a pace to that, I'd say that the pace is increasing. So again, maybe there is a case for stopping using this word beginning with C and instead thinking about adaptation, right? Responsiveness, understanding that your rules, your assumptions, your generalizations that may be valid today won't be, very, won't be valid for very long. And so ultimately, if you believe that being an adaptive human puts us, <laughs> is a strength as opposed to a weakness, then how do you ensure that you adapt? Part of it is reflecting, I suppose, more readily. Part of it is challenging this bias towards relentless execution and some of it is just acknowledging that there are sometimes better ways to do things and there are sometimes ways that it work now that won't work in the future so i think that creativity therefore is about future proofing yourself your business it's also about being more resilient isn't it because that part of resilience is your capacity to adapt to an ever-changing environment. So, yeah, I think it's critical. I, I, I agree with you, and I think you talked about this relentless pace. Uh, certainly in a lot of critical care medicine, we are s slaves to time targets, and we have enormous pressures that perhaps we didn't have before. And one of the results of that is biased thinking and uh, rigid thinking, and I think uh, creativity is the flip side of rigid thinking and biases. And I think we're all aware that we need to be sort of constantly at our own biases. Uh, and so perhaps it's a more flexible way of, an adaptable way of thinking. Scott, um, anything positive from Twitter? I, <laughs> well, you've, you've thrown me for a loop looking for positivity. Um, well, there has been a sentiment that's been echoed by numerous commenters, which is, uh, a lot of misery in the workplace comes from the feeling of lack of control. And if you're in one of these organizations that are hierarchical and locked down, and then you are creative and have an idea, and then it goes nowhere, it's almost worse than not having these creative ideas. How do you deal with those kind of organizations? I think Carol might be a good one to answer that. Yeah, I, I'm not sure I have any answers for you. I think that uh, it's very important to try and create a workplace where everybody has a voice. I think our best ideas come from bringing people in and letting everybody have a seat at the table. Um, I am famous for asking questions and, and having being surrounded by a lot of people. And I think that the more we do that, the better we are. And I don't just mean even in your workplace, if you've got an important question, generally what you'll find is that somebody else somewhere around the world will have the same question as you and you bring in like-minded people. So 
you know, making sure that you've got a very diverse group. By, by diverse, I don't mean just gender diversity, I mean culturally diverse, I mean age diversity. I think just the more opinions you can seek and the more, more people you can bring in, the, the, the uh, quicker you'll be able to solve a problem, uh, although I'm not really famous for quick solutions. But, you know, I do think that, you know, bringing people in is incredibly important. I think this issue of diversity is very, very important um, for a number of reasons. Uh, I, I think there's this term, an echo chamber, which you've all heard, and I think many of us struggle with this, with the people that we follow on Twitter, or on Facebook, on social media particularly. Uh, most of us are singing from the same hymn book. Um, and so are our ideas when we put them out, particularly on social media, can they possibly be diverse if we're not actively seeking out alternate views? And does that really impact upon our diversity of teams? Um, Ollie, what do you think about that? Um, yeah, I completely agree. I mean, I think that, well, if you're trying to solve a particular problem or um, uh, target a particular audience, um, understand that audience is completely uh, critical to that. So if you're trying to communicate, um, d defining who you're trying to communicate to and understanding who they are and what you want them to think, feel or do with what you're trying to communicate with is absolutely essential. So I think in terms of when you're defining a problem, working out who the audience is and trying to understand them is, is absolutely key. That's a slightly different question to the echo chamber thing though. Yeah, I, I realize. I think the echo chamber thing is here to stay at the moment. Um, I think that's a very, very difficult problem to, particularly in social media. We see that problem a lot in the agricultural world. Um, we're, we're constantly victims of preaching to the converted when it comes to our best practice animal welfare standards and animal husbandry and all, you know, about food and fibre and the origin and the way we do things in Australia being the best. Yet, when an, an issue happens, like the live export ban um, in 2011, which shut down the trade due to the community uh, reaction and backlash, um, you know, it was very evident that we as an industry were not getting the message out well enough about how uh, we were operating. And, you know, it's all well and good to get stories to run in the Queensland country life and all the rural press papers, but if those messages aren't penetrating the SMH and the, uh, the other sort of media sources, uh, you know, we're, we're in our own echo chamber and we aren't able to shift the needle and have that empathy around well, what do we want them to think, see and do. Um, it's about knowing your audience, I think. It certainly broadens out the question, doesn't it? Because we're sort of saying to be, to have a creative life, a creative mindset, we need to take lots of information from different areas and that includes listening to different voices. And I think this is another crisis we're all facing at the moment, which is there was good on both sides. You know, when, you know, regarding uh, all sorts, you know, right wing, uh, white supremacy, right wing behaviour. Do we have an obligation? Do we need to be listening to all voices? Are all voices, uh, you know, how far does free speech go? And how should we be addressing that fine line between not having an echo chamber, but not giving voice to things which are inherently evil? This is wow. way out of scope. So sorry. Wow. You go, that's Boom. your fault. You do it with facts and you take, you, you take the emotion off the table and you speak to it with facts. So, you know, we can't, uh, in this era of fake news and citizen journalism and, you know, the Twitter sphere, uh, you know, dictating headlines, the, the power to the individual to be doing that from a desk, from no authority or position of power. Um, or sometimes in you know those powerful individuals who are speaking non-factually as well, they're guilty of that. You, you've got to come back at it quickly and with facts, and that is the the difference of how you can see a whole issue spiral uh, versus owning that message quickly uh, and proactively. I have a feeling I ought to just <laughs> pop the train back on the original tracks yeah. here. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, no, no, that's completely my fault. Take responsibility. Um, a creative mindset would be very nice. I, I'm sure you're aware that the, the SMAC conference ha is going to build on this conversation. We're starting the conversation, what is creativity and why is it important to know about it? And there will be further sessions about really putting it into place. But I'd, I'd be interested just to talk a little bit about 
How do we optimise that creative process as individuals? How can we be more creative? You talked about showers, awesome, um, and those you know walks in the park. It's really trying to understand what creativity was. I, I was at a talk by a, a very eminent um, neuroscientist who basically said, we have absolutely no idea how creativity actually works from a neuroscientific point of view. We do all these functional MRIs and little bits of people's brains light up when they answer questions, but we still haven't figured it out. So does anyone want to have a crack? I'm going to go to you, Phil. You don't, not necessarily the brain bits, but the process, how we can be more adaptive. OK, nice reframe. Not creative, adaptive. I like that. It's starting to happen. Um, briefly, the neuroscience piece on creativity, yes, it's very difficult to measure, partly because of things we've already established, which is it has very different forms. But at the same time, what does originality look from the brain's perspective? Well, a new connection or a reorganization, so there's something there. I think the insights from creative research more recently is to understand the creative mechanisms in terms of opposing networks, right? So it's kind of back to reinforcing some of the things we've discussed already. The idea of the executive network, right? This kind of very linear, executing, step-by-step, -step, ticking things off, and the default network. And firstly, in creative, very creative people, we notice that there is this unusual capacity for both networks to be active simultaneously. For most of us, what we notice is creativity increases when activity in the executive network reduces and activity in the default network increases. So what's the insight there? Well, it's back to the same sort of point, that the default network, as you, I'm sure you know, is associated with more of the, the mind wandering, the less of the controlled execution, and it's when the brain becomes a bit of an association machine, not just these aha moments, but research on divergent thinking, the same shift happens. Research on improvisation, right? Rappers or jazz musicians, as they get into flow, what reliably happens are these correlates. The executive network reduces, so dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, and at the same time, the medial prefrontal cortex starts to become more active. So there is some research. But then the question is, what can we do to become more creative at, or more adaptive? And again, let's reinforce the fact that this exists across a process that can be developed at each separate stage. I explained in my talk creativity in terms of three separate steps, but uh, there are more. We've acknowledged that the first step could be defined in terms of preparation or absorption, right, diversity. And as an individual, what does that look like? Where well, you become the Einstein, the polymath, the multidisciplinarian, someone that deliberately crosses domains in order that you have more unfamiliar stuff here. That would be one step. The next is repeating some of the stuff I've already said. Get better at challenging your assumptions. Get better at resisting the path of least resistance. Echo chambers, confirmation bias, right? Reframe problems, do that early in the, in the creative process. Then, idea generation, again, echoing what's already been covered. Give it more time, involve more people, shift your perceptual position, try to see the challenge through other people. And then there's the, all right, now we need to process this stuff. Default network, go for a walk, get in the shower. I can't believe I'm telling you to have more showers, but you get the point. <laughs> and then the very final stage, which I didn't talk to, but we are, Des certainly is making the point, and the mindset piece as well. The final stage of creativity is action, implementation, iteration, which presupposes clear vision, direction, goals, outcome orientation, away from this busyness, reactive, responsive. And then you've got to iterate, and this is when the mindset comes in. Your capacity to cultivate a healthy relationship with failure knowing that that is ultimately only feedback and it allows for the iterative process to happen. So, lots of things to be working on, but there are my top tips to becoming more creative, certainly as an individual. Scott, any further comments? Yeah, there's a great one. Uh, what is the role of diet and sleep on creativity and is our medical practice uh, destroying our creativity through those two venues? And then they added on and I, I don't know if anyone's going to answer, but what's the role of microdosing of psychedelics to inspire creativity? 
I have on my little list of questions, drugs, good or bad? It's actually a, an interesting question, certainly historically. I'm not quite sure who wants to tackle that one. Well, I can start. Um, microdosing in particular, as long as it's micro, and this is not a suggestion, by the way, I didn't include this. But one of the things that reliably happens is it increases connectivity across brain networks. That's what part of what creativity is. So again, not a suggestion, not advice, but an observation that they almost coexist as the same neural uh, activity up to a point. That's me done. There was some, <laughs> when there was some early uh, experiments like in the 60s with the mescaline where they uh, gave people um, creative challenges to do and they found people like were far much more, more productive. They got a group of Silicon Valley entrepreneurs together and they found that they came up with a lot more ideas on mescaline versus not. <laughs> Again, not an advice thing, but. The future of off-sites, I suppose. Yeah. Excellent. Um, I, I do believe there is a sort of a bell curve, maybe a spectrum of what we're talking about here from the little c creativity. And I think we've be, all been talking about these, the small acts of everyday thinking and behavior within teams, when you're in your workplace, to, yeah, to have a more adaptive sort of life. And, and on the other side, of course, is the the bigger C, creativity, the traditional acts of creation, uh, creating works of art, etc. cetera. Um, Oli, I'd be interested in uh, a couple of theories that you spoke about, like procrastinating, and as well as, which is a grand favorite of mine, um, and quantity over quality. Yes, yeah, so this, the procrastination thing's interesting because uh, I was reading about um, procrastinators um, which is a good way of procrastinating. <laughs> and uh, it actually turns out like the procrastination phenomenon is almost like the Starling curve that we learn about in physiology. So people who don't procrastinate at all are less creative than people who are like medium procrastinators. And then if you're an extreme procrastinator, you never finish anything. So <laughs> the, um, and the, I think the theory behind that is if you allow ideas to percolate and without completely finishing them, then you continue to work on them subconsciously, new ideas come online, you might get stimulated by something else that you weren't expecting, and then you're allowing yourself to go back and change it right till the very end, which can then result in a more original, uh, improved product and help you create more original solutions or ideas or be an original thinker. So that I thought was really interesting, actually. So a degree of procrastination. Martin Luther King, apparently, he only came up with I have a dream as he walked out onto the stage. Yeah. So he was up till three o'clock in the morning writing the speech. Yeah, that was all last minute. But the actual I have a dream came to him at the right minute. And he, because he was a procrastinator, it left himself open to be able to do that. It's like, that'd be a good, that'd be a good one. And it, it was. It was wonderful. Um, and the, the, the thought of producing quantity over quality work. So this, um, Phil also discussed a bit in his talk, and it's something I've thought about a lot. And it's really referring to that brainstorming phase of a project when you are, you've already identified what you're trying to do. You've got a mission objective, and you um, have set who the audience is and what you want them to think, feel, or do. So you're not at that phase, you're at this um, brainstorming phase. And at this point, if you then go about trying to create as many different ideas as possible without judging, exactly as Phil said, um, it ends up with um, you much more likely to have that fantastic standout idea um, than if you just spent all your time working on one idea. So this is the classic examples, this, um, the, the pottery class, where half the class were told that they need to spend uh, all their time making as many pots as possible. It's not about the quality, it's about quantity. They just have to crank out as many as they can. And the other half of the class, were only, they only had to produce one pot, but it's got to be really great. And at the end of the, uh, at the, end of the, the term when they were assessed, the best pots um, objectively assessed came from the class that were making as many as they could. 
because that randomness, the, the, the high out, output allowed, some of the pots would have been absolute shockers, but some of them were great, and, that's, and that works with ideas as well. So if you're not trying to edit as you're going along and you smash out loads of ideas, that's when the, the real gold will come out. If you allow wild ideas, wild thinking, and um, don't worry about being judged at that point, that's, that's really helpful. So that's been something I've learned about the creative process is about cranking out loads of ideas and don't be too precious about them. And that certainly harks into what you talked about, Phil, with um, failure and just, you have to fail. I don't think there is, it is possible to have a creative life without a very significant uh, percentage of your time failing and failing wildly. Um, Des, you mentioned about the constraints of, of perhaps a medical life, a medical career. Uh, I'm interested in this aspect or, um, or this theory of medicine beating the creativity out of you because, uh, you know, I, I certainly understood. I, I always had in my heart that I was a writer. I was convinced I was a writer and I didn't write a thing for 20 years while I was trying to be a half-decent doctor. Uh, that took all of my bandwidth. Every moment, every neuron was sort of focused on raising children, I think, I <laughs> did a little bit of that, and um, my medical career, and I couldn't have written until a good 20 years had gone by. And then I realised that I, I was lacking in that, that wild creative school. I had to go back and relearn it from the start to be able to write. I think that medicine does beat the stuffing of creativity out of us. Um, I, I, do you agree with that, Des, and has that got uh, real repercussions? No, I, I do, but I think um, the value proposition in the future for doctors in particular will be around communication skills, actually, uh, because the value proposition of the past was our ability to take on and retain large amounts of knowledge and to use the knowledge in an analytical way. And now that value proposition no longer has value. Uh, in the same way that when you sit in the back of a London taxi, taxi and you're looking at your phone and you're thinking, what am I paying this person for? The value proposition's gone. Mm. And when, and when I first went to London in 1978, the value proposition was clear. He knew how to get from the airport to the Strand Palace Hotel. When I was there a few weeks ago, I mean, got caught in a traffic jam. My phone told me we were going to be in a traffic jam 15 minutes before we were. So what was I paying him for? And I think the same is true of medicine. Uh, when I started practicing 40 odd years ago, there was no doubt the value proposition was knowledge based. I don't think it is knowledge based anymore. I, I think it's now the ability to help people uh, articulate the information available to them in a way where they can make sensible decisions. Clearly for a lot of the people in the room who are intensivists, who are dealing with people in a critically ill state, that participatory role is probably not so great as it is for me as a physician, but we're still recruiting medical students on their intellectual ability to retain information. We are preparing them that way and we're examining them that way. For me, to, when I prepared for the part one exam in 1979, I memorized Harrison's textbook of medicine. The most anti-intellectual process you could ever go through in your life. Uh, <laughs> and I'm still suffering because my head's full of stuff that I thought was true, that was complete, that's complete nonsense. Uh, and that's what I meant before about crushing scepticism. So, so I actually think the value proposition's changed, but my college, the College of Physicians, still worships at the altar of knowledge, whereas I think the future value proposition for doctors won't be uh, lateral thinking, it won't be innovative thinking so much as it'll be communication skills and the ability to actually help people make very good decisions about their health care. And the answer to the question, by the way, of that person you talked about who doesn't feel valued, they're probably in the wrong job. Um, but bearing in mind that there's the behavioural economists talk about the endowment effect where we overvalue our thoughts and we overvalue our possessions. But even taking that into account, I think within procedural type medicine, your role in life is to make good better. And I think, you know, as Voltaire said, don't let perfect be the enemy of the good. But if you are a genuinely innovative, creative person, uh, I wonder if you're in the right job. And you know, if I look at the elite medical schools in the US, a lot of their graduates never ever practice clinical medicine. 
and that's probably a good thing. <laughs> Scott, do you have any sort of last questions that you can throw at our panelists from Twitter? Yeah. Yeah, this one's dear to my heart. How do we inspire and preserve creativity in our children? Mm. Well, who was that question for? Any? I've got four oh, children. Okay. I'll give that one a go. Um, so I think that the first thing that you have to do is give them time to be creative. Like, you know, we make our kids so busy. With, uh, one of my children was so busy there, I'm not, she didn't even have one night where she could have a friend over for a play or, you know, that's ridiculous. I, you know, stop. No more. Um, the second thing is to create conversation. So we make sure that we all sit down to dinner and ideas are bounced off each other and everybody has an opportunity to talk about their day and bring up something that was interesting or bring up something that they're having a problem with or talk about issues that were um, perhaps uh, issues of conflict or issues that were fantastic in their day or something that they want to build on. Uh, that's, I think that's incredibly important. But most importantly, I think it is encouraging them to do something that they love. Because if you're doing something that you love, you'll probably be creative and fabulous at it. I certainly agree with that. Um, anybody else? I think maybe there's something to... Uh a value in inverting the question and ask instead, how can kids remind us to be creative? And much of the things you've just said, any behavior you want to kind of reinforce in children, if you model it, it's probably gonna be more likely. So maybe the question, the final piece is, to what degree can we model the creativity we'd like to see in children? Because all the things you just said, it's pretty good um, principles for I think many of us. We've only got a few more minutes, and I'd like to just ask you to show off, each of you, what do you feel in your life has been your most creative endeavor? And I'm going to start down with you, Des. Uh, what are you most proud of? Well, uh, you've you got to remember that uh, I went to medical school by mistake. Uh, I, was, <laughs> I was on my way to rugby training, uh, <laughs> and the person I was with uh, uh, said, look, called and I said, what are you doing? He said, I'm getting an application form for Auckland Medical School. I said, well, grab one for me. So the most creative thing I ever did when I became the head of the medical school was to pretend to the students who had a lifelong ambition to do medicine that I was one of them. <laughs> <laughs> That's very good. Carol? Um, so, on a personal level, it's definitely having children. I mean, that's pretty creative, and especially so because I was told I couldn't have children by the professor of IVF, so that does feel especially special. Um, but I guess on a, on a professional level, it's getting to a point where I can lead clinical trials in intensive care medicine as a physiotherapist, and I think that I'm really proud of our group and their diversity for recognising that you know, you can be female and non-medical and you can still lead trials in our group. And there's a couple of us, Emma's in the audience, she's a dietitian. Um, she's also leading some fantastic large trials and Lisa's our health economist. You know, we've, we've all carved out a niche for ourselves in our group, which is um, broadly a medical group, yeah. Ollie. I'm going to go for the, uh, the low-hanging fruit, which is the, the part that I've played in this, because I'm very proud of it, and I think it's awesome. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You kind of stole mine, Ollie. I'm involved um, in the beef industry. I sit on the board for Beef Australia, and we hold a smack-type event every three years. It's the largest trade industry event uh, for our sector with hundreds over 100,000 people through the gates in Rocky every year. And it's a fantastic um, forum to um, broaden your thinking, extend beyond your day job and your family life and create that third dimension, build your networks and try and anticipate what's going to be relevant um, and important for us to be thinking about as an industry three years out. So I think that's a really good extension um, creatively for me. Um, I honestly don't know. I mean, I've, uh, I've been a musician, I suppose. I've now been an author. But I think my, the form of creativity that I'm most proud of, certainly, is the stuff that I've been doing today in some of the workshops yesterday, which is trying to 
reframe all of the stuff I know and trying to help other people kind of assimilate it in a way that they use their brain in a more active way. So it's quite a non-specific answer to that, but that's the thing that I'm certainly most proud of and certainly most engaged in. So we're going to wrap it up there. Um, I will ask you to thank the panel in just a moment, but I just wanted to re reiterate that um, what an extraordinary day that we've had. We've heard about resilience and love uh, compassion uh, and extraordinary human stories and now we've topped it off by talking about one of those other incredible things that we do as humans that animals just don't do you know we can reach into ourselves and we can imagine things that were never there and we can put them into action so I thank you all for attending this session and please thank our inspiring panelists <laughs> <laughs>